So today, <clears throat> today we're talking about pain and inflammation and kind of, oh, there's me, um, and the root cause of kind of how we get there. So it all has to do with the immune system, okay? Um, so you guys already know who I am. My name is Kylie Matichuk. Uh, I'm, a, I'm called the Yogi Foodie Printer, which is just uh, the mesh of me being a holistic nutritionist and a yoga teacher and a business owner. And I work with people in Thompson and all over Canada. So we're going to start at the immune system today. Um, the immune system's role is to protect and defend the body. So here you can see all of the different uh, organs that are associated with the immune system. So you want to make sure that that puppy is always, always uh, good to go. The immune response is the way in which your body recognizes and defends itself against bacteria, viruses, and other substances that are foreign and harmful. It is the job of the immune system to protect our bodies from harmful invaders by recognizing and responding to antigens. Uh, typically, proteins and antigens reside on the surface of cells, viruses, fungi, or bacteria. But anti-agents also may be non-living substances, including toxins, chemicals, uh, drugs, and foreign particles like splinters. The immune system remembers, recognizes, and destroys antigen-containing substances. So throughout the talk, you'll realize why we're starting with the immune system when we're trying to deal with pain, okay? Um, <clears throat> I want to show you this cool slide here. If you can see, you can see some of it. Um, I'm going to talk to you about um, in relation inflammation in relation to food sensitivities or intolerances. Because remember how I said at the beginning that it all uh, our health um, kind of depends on our digestion, right? So sensitivities are complex. We talked about this a little bit before in a, in a previous talk. They're complex, non-allergic inflammatory reactions that can involve both innate and adaptive immune pathways. A variety of triggering mechanisms trigger uh, reactions in various types of white cells, leading to the release of pro-inflammatory mediators. Uh, or medi mediators release uh, and cellular reactivity, reactivity ultimately results in subclinical and clinical inflammatory effects manifesting in a variety of conditions and symptoms. Okay, um, so sometimes the food is always put on the back burner. It doesn't matter what we eat. Whatever we have, we're going to slap a medication on it and kind of deal with it that way. But it always goes back to what we're putting into our body. The consequences of food-induced activation of the immune system can initially be subtle, uh, but may become serious over time. The continuous intake of reactive substances causes local microinflammation in the intestinal tissue, which spreads and can manifest itself to other tissues. So it always begins in the digestive tract. Our, um, our health. Therefore, the hormonal, nervous, and metabolic systems can be affected and symptoms can or may manifest in various forms. This makes it complex and symptoms might not be identified with food intolerance as the cause, as the initial cause. And usually when we go see a healthcare practitioner, it's never about food intolerances. If we have a disorder or disease, we treat the disease or doctors treat the disease. Um, a 2010 survey of the Society for Nutrition Therapy and Prevention reported that 67% of respondents suffer from intermittent or persistent gastrointestinal symptoms, including bloating or abdominal pain after eating. The people that come see me, everyone has an issue with digestion. Everybody has a little bit of flatulence, a little bit of bloating after they eat with certain types of foods. Um, it's very rare that I don't see people that have that. So, an important cause may be food intolerance, which is mediated by the innate immune system. Um, it leads to typical adverse reactions and inflammatory processes. Defense reactions creates the basis for microinflammation and centers of inflammation. The whole system is a very effective first defense strategy against acute infections, but chronic activation will lead to health disorders. Um, <clears throat> Some pathophysiological uh, effects include the inflammation, inflammation itself and tissue damage. This is where we get pain from. Smooth muscle contraction, edema, which is swelling of the body. Excess mucus, neurological disorders, so like migraine headaches. Uh, endocrine or glandular disorders and gut irritation. <clears throat> so, I want to talk to you a little bit about what causes pain and inflammation. Sugar. Sugar, sugar, sugar. Okay, 
the sugar connection. So while weight gain and teeth decay might be the most obvious consequences of excessive sugar consumption, there are many, many other hidden effects of consuming too much sugar. Other studies have now linked high sugar consumption to inflammatory diseases like osteoarthritis and other joint pain, fibromyalgia, heart disease, and more. So heart disease, high quantities of sugar stress, uh, sugar stress out the heart and decrease its muscle function. According to research published in the Journal of the American Heart Association, eventually the situation can cause heart failure in some cases. So heart failure from sugar. Joint pain, this is complete, this is very common. There are many kinds of joint pain and inflammation, including various forms of arthritis. We all have joint pain. Well, we're, we have sugar in our coffee. We have, even caffeine is acidic, uh, which causes joint inflammation. Um, sugar is in high starch foods. It's, it's everywhere. Um, we're not supposed to have joint pain just because we're getting older, okay? Um, so this is, or it affects more than one third of adults older than 65 and 14% of people over 25. A research paper from the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition reviewed several studies showing processed sugar can increase inflammation that causes joint pain. Um, brain function, so one of the more surprising negative effects of sugar consumption, surprising for uh, consumers, involves the brain. A study published in Neuroscience showed high levels of added sugar can reduce uh, production of a chemical called brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Um, so usually you see in children, it, um, they'll have hyperactivity from sugar, um, ADD, ADHD, and just behavioral issues. Um, migraines, a lot of people get migraines just from excess sugar. With inadequate levels of this chemical, the brain derived, or the neurotrophic factor, um, normal cognitive tasks, just like learning and basic memory function, are more difficult. Other effects, in addition to the ailments listed above, other health problems connected to excessive sugar, include kidney disease, fatty liver disease, wrinkling and sagging of prematurely aged skin, and even erectile dysfunction. With many of these, pain can be a side effect. Removing processed and refined sugar from your diet to avoid pain, inflammation, and general acidity in the body from sugar is essential. We have to get rid of the sugar. We have to get rid of the processed sugar somehow. Keep in mind that starchy foods like chips, white bread, basically any white flour, um, uh, pastries, pasta, and fries are quickly converted into simple sugars by your body. They have, essential, they have essentially the same effect as eating candy or drinking a can of soda. Remember, whatever you're putting into your body is either feeding or fighting a disease, right? So we're addicted to sugar. Some of us have something called candidiasis, or yeast. Okay, so when we have excess amount of this yeast in the intestines, all it wants, this is bacteria, all it wants us to eat is sugar. So we're craving sugar all the time. <clears throat> so yeast is a fungus that has us craving sugars, breads, and alcohol to keep the bacteria colonies growing, creating further pain and discomfort for you. So a lot of people feel, oh, well, I don't even know where to localize my pain. I feel pain everywhere. That could be a huge uh, part of perhaps having candida. <clears throat> so its correct name is Candida albicans, and it is often misdiagnosed. It is a pathogen that takes advantage of a disruption in the balance of microorganisms in your gut. This balance of gut flora is a crucial part of your immune system and digestive health, but it can easily be lost during periods of stress or especially after a course of antibiotics. When this balance is lost, the colonies of Candida albicans are able to expand rapidly until they control a large portion of your gut. And that's when we start feeling pain and, and all of these different issues. Candida albicans releases up to 79 different byproducts. Acetaldehyde is one of them, being responsible for causing chronic headaches and brain fog, and was recently classified as a potential carcinogen by the International Agency for Research on Cancer. Uric acid is another byproduct that can cause joint pain and lead to gout if an excess builds up. Meanwhile, the change in your gut flora can lead to digestive problems, food intolerances, yeast infections, and oral thrush. So by misdiagnosed, usually you are in chronic illness or you have a metabolic syn um, uh, syndrome like diabetes before um, we start looking into candida. So um, 
if you were just to go to go to a healthcare practitioner and kind of talk about the symptoms that you might be facing, they primarily don't talk about candida as what could be causing all of these issues. They wait until you are actually faced with the disease to be able to um, work with candida. So it's important to recognize the symptoms of candida right off the bat in a, in a normal uh, healthy person that may have just you know, taken a bout of antibiotics or just eating too much sugar and these colonies are multiplying. You wanna be able to catch them quick before they spread into an actual disease. Um, a study by Rice University found that around 70% of us have candida albicans in our gut. So 70%, that sounds like a lot. However, the fact is that most of the time candida is completely harmless. It exists in small colonies and is kept under control by the other microorganisms in your gut. Candida only becomes a problem when we do something to change that balance, like what I said about uh, antibiotics. Um, most people that come see me in regards to pain and an endless list of disorders are suffering from an overgrowth of candida. When we support the gut with a proper candida protocol, many of these disorders are corrected. So instead of thinking, oh, well, I, got, I, have, I have so many headaches and migraines all the time, so I'm taking Tylenol for that. Or, you know, I have joint pain, so I have some kind of, you know, steroid because I, I need to reduce the inflammation. Um, you know, I have uh, heartburn, so now I'm taking an antacid. So you're trying to treat all these different symptoms when we need to be treating the root cause, right? <clears throat> if you can see this. So this is the normal immune response in the body, and this is the autoimmune response. So an autoimmune disorder is when the body starts attacking itself. Okay, um, and again, we're going to talk about how all of this kind of links to pain. So what happens if we ignore the food tolerances, and we ignore the constant sugar, and we ignore the overgrowth from candida? So this is most of the population. Oh, we're just going to continue drinking, you know, soda. We're just going to continue doing this. We're going to continue with these bad habits. What's going to happen? Um, do we just hope or medicate ourselves enough for everything to just go away, right? Um, of course not. They will not go away unless you choose to do something about it, or in reality, understand enough to know what to do about it, right? That's what most of us are doing. We don't, we don't know. We see this information, we see that information, and we're in the middle. Like, where do we go? We go see this uh, healthcare practitioner, they're telling you one thing. Go see this one, they're telling you another thing. Go see posters up in clinics. Everything is conflicting and you're sitting there in pain and you don't know what to do. You don't know where to go. Um, so in reality, we need to kind of learn more about our own bodies and what's going on to be able to help ourselves first. <clears throat> because let's be honest, most of the information in this talk and all the talks that I'm giving isn't available for the average person to seek, especially in Northern Manitoba. Right? Trying to change that. When we ignore the negative and inflammatory responses from our body that our body is telling us that something is wrong, then the body starts to attack itself, which is the autoimmune um, condition. Autoimmune conditions are connected by one central biochemical process, a runway immune response, also known as systemic inflammation that results in your body attacking its own tissues. Not fun. Like any disease, genetics play a huge role in determining your reasoning for being diagnosed with an autoimmune disease. But it's not a for sure thing, right? Your environment, habits, and lifestyle can increase the likeliness of developing an autoimmune disorder if you have some of the genetic markers. So if you're told, you know, oh, my mom had this disorder, I'm going to get it. If you think like that, you probably will get it, right? But you have to kind of collectively look, collectively look at everything around you to give yourself the, the best... Um, chance to be able to not kind of get yourself into this kind of path, which you still can come out of it. Um, a lot of people are struggling with autoimmune disease, such as, such as this genetic predisposition. They use it as a crutch to justify how they got to their health crisis. The body is designed to heal itself, but we need to make the conscious choice of enabling it to do so. And that's really hard for a lot of people, right? So I'm going to put it all together here. <clears throat> This is a little flow chart here. Uh, we are facing an epidemic of allergic, 60 million people, asthmatic, 30 million people, and autoimmune disorders, 24 million people. Autoimmune diseases include rheumatoid, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, multiple, uh, multiple sclerosis or MS, psoriasis is even an autoimmune disorder, celiac disease, uh, thyroid diseases, and the many other hard to classify syn uh, syndromes in the 21st century. So these are all autoimmune conditions, and at their root, they are connected by one central biochemical process, which as I mentioned, the runway, a runaway immune response known as the systemic inflammation 
that results in the body trying to attack itself and its own tissues. Your immune system is your defense against invaders. It is your internal army and has to clear, clearly distinguish from uh, friend from foe to know you from others. Autoimmunity occurs when your immune system gets confused and your own tissues get caught in friendly crossfire. So your body is fighting something, an infection, a toxin, an allergen, a food, or their stress response, and somehow it redirects its hostile attack on your own joints, on your brain, on your thyroid, on your guts, on your skin, or sometimes your whole body. Okay? This immune confusion results from what is referred to as molecular mimicry. Conventional approaches don't have a method for finding the insult causing the problem. Functional medicine provides a map to find out which molecule the cells are mimicking. And functional medicine is uh, it's a really cool system um, of healthcare where you have actual medical doctors that are working um, uh, holistically. So they are trained medical doctors to be able to treat diseases and disorders, but they're using a holistic approach. So finding the root cause, the mind-body connection, all of that. So hopefully this is the path moving forward um, so you can find these doctors. Increasing, interestingly, autoimmune disorders occur almost exclusively in developed countries. Isn't that interesting? People in poor nations without modern amenities like running water, flush toilets, washing machines, and sterile backyards don't get these diseases. Yeah, so developed countries. If you grew up on a farm with a lot of animals, you're also less likely to have these inflammatory disorders. Playing in the dirt, being dirty, and being exposed to bugs and infections when you're little trains your immune system to recognize what is foreign, okay, and what is you, right? In this country, autoimmune diseases, when taken all together, are a huge health burden. They are the eighth leading cause of death among women, shortening the average person's lifespan by eight years. The annual health care cost for autoimmune diseases is $120 billion a year, representing nearly twice the economic health care burden of cancer, which is $70 billion. Isn't that nuts? Unfortunately, many of the conventional treatments available can make you feel worse. These are conventional treatments. Anti-inflammatory drugs like Advil, steroids, immune suppressants, and TNF alpha blockers uh, can lead to intestinal bleeding, kidney failure, depression, uh, mood disorders, psychosis, osteoporosis, muscle loss, and diabetes, not to mention overwhelming infection and even cancer. So when used selectively, these drugs can help people get their, their lives back, but they are not a long-term solution. They shouldn't be the end of treatment, but a bridge to cool off inflammation while we understand the root cause of the disease. So am I telling you to stop taking these medications? No, of course I'm not. Ultimately, you make the final decision regarding your health, and you are in charge of your lifestyle. But it's my responsibility to ensure that you know I'm not a medical doctor. I do not tell people that I'm able to treat or cure diseases. But I do, however, know how to support the health of the body using vigorous preventative measures to avoid disease and disorder from developing in the first place, and can continue to provide the support if and when a disease or imbalance occurs. So what can we do? all this overwhelming scary stuff that we just listened to but what can we do there's lots of things we can do right these aren't these aren't life sentences okay try to remember the body has the ability to heal itself and I know that's hard when we're faced in uh, a healthcare uh, world or environment where you're faced with death from disease every single day everybody knows someone who passed away from cancer everybody knows someone who has diabetes all of these different things um, your mindset plays a huge role so you might be sitting here today or listening to this and you're in chronic pain. Um, you're in chronic pain from an autoimmune disorder, from all of these different things, from having candida, from being addicted to sugar. Um, all of this information makes sense, but it's obviously really overwhelming. So what can we do? Well, <clears throat> you start with baby steps, right? Remember to change the lifestyle. We need to start with habits because humans are habitual people. We cannot change our habits overnight let go of that expectation and learn to trust the process. Our society is results driven, right? We want everything right now, right now. We need it because, you know, we are told if we don't do something right now, we're going to die or something, something terrible is going to happen, right? Um, <clears throat> when we throw our health into that, we get really anxious. And I, as I mentioned before, uh, a few weeks ago, when people have felt that they have exhausted all their medical options, 
um, or healthcare options, then they come see me and think that I have some magic herb, magic herbal potion, I'm gonna give it to them and they're gonna be fine overnight, right? Um, I wish I could do that, but I, I don't. Um, so the cure is changing your lifestyle. That it, that's ultimately what it is. Your eating habits, your levels of stress, your disposition of life, the amount of negativity you have towards yourself and others, the amount of sleep you're getting, the amount of water you're drinking, uh, the access you have to fresh air, uh, and your breathing quality, those are all things that you need to try to work on. All of these things listed here. Um, so you need to understand that you have to take care of your life, not when it's too late, but right now. So you wanna start with your diet, get rid of the sugar, and all sources where sugar comes from. This includes processed dairy products, uh, another conflicting issue that we can't touch on today. Um, starchy carbohydrates, excess consumption of red meats, um, again, controversial. Um, the amount of burnt or well-done foods like toast and meats. So basically just trying to decrease the acidity, okay? Um, not forever, but if you have chronic illness or chronic pain, you don't want to be continuing to feed it with foods that cause acidity. Why would you do that, right? Include fermented foods like kombucha, which is fermented tea, uh, kimchi, and sauerkraut. Consume an overabundance of green vegetables. Um, now in the age of smoothies, we can kind of hide. We can hide a whole pack of, of spinach in a smoothie and we won't taste it. It'll look green, but we won't taste it. Because if you don't like the way vegetables taste, then that's your decision and your choice, because the information is how, the information is there to how to feel better, okay? Nobody, nobody loves the taste of raw spinach initially when you're used to eating chocolate and candy and coffee and beer all the time, right? It's hard, it's hard to do that. It's hard to just switch, shut this lifestyle off and go into this lifestyle. So we gotta take baby steps so that it feels normal. So we try to start to change our lifestyle habits because it's not, it might not be the most favorable or comfortable, but your health is on the line here, right? The food we eat has a direct connection to how we feel. It always begins with what we are putting in our mouths. So I wanna show you here, um, what are some movements? So it's not all just about nutrition too. We need to be able to move, right? But if you're, if you're bedridden um, or if you're dealing with chronic pain, and all you see is, well, we gotta do some cardio exercise, we gotta do some aerobics, we gotta do blah, 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 right? It's not all of that. Um, it might be just as simple as, you know, doing a little bit of yoga or qigong or tai chi, things that aren't really, other than the yoga, um, aren't really oversaturated in Northern Manitoba, right? Nobody knows about all these things. You're probably thinking, oh, what's qigong, you know? Well, it's just kind of slow movements following your breath, okay? Um, so <clears throat> what Western health, as a yoga teacher, what Western health has perceived yoga as is actually what it's not, okay? So it's not just physical exercise. I will sit with bedridden people, they cannot move, and I'll just move them over to um, a window or I'll just prop open the window and I'll just help them to breathe. And that's it, that's all they need to get going. They don't need to be forced out of bed, they don't need to get up or anything like that because a lot of these people can't, right? Um, you wanna be able to breathe deeply. <clears throat> deeply into the lungs. So in yoga, these breath movements or breath control techniques are called pranayama. This moves fresh air into the deep neglected areas of the body and act as a method of recharging. We only breathe into the top areas of the lungs. We usually breathe in through the mouth. Understanding um, to breathe deep into the belly and in through the nose, which has a built-in filtration system, right? We don't have the little cilia or filtration system in our mouth. We're supposed to breathe in through the nose. Um, this will dramatically change the health of anybody that consistently focuses on breathing properly. Um, and this seems like, oh, well, I already know how to breathe. Like, that's ridiculous. It, but it's so true. It's just changing the way you breathe so that you have quality uh, breathing methods. Um, so this is step one, just breathing. That's it. You can participate in chair yoga. So again, you don't even have to, we could do yoga right there, sitting in chairs. Um, nothing strenuous, or it could just be basic stretching that connects the power uh, of moving the breath uh, and connecting it to our physical body works. So, if you were to take two takeaways from this, because um, I know this information is super overwhelming. It's hard to start moving forward with conflicting information. There are natural health care practitioners everywhere in this country, but not enough in the North, right? I hope that through these talks you understand that there are people here like me 
that are fighting for your health care and are working with all levels of government to provide further options, not replacements. That has to be in stone, not replacements um, of health care that we have here because it's very good. We just need other options. Um, and we want to provide um, we, we want to provide information so that you have the choice to choose how you want to treat your health. If you could take two pieces from this talk on how to lower the amount of pain and inflammation in the body, it would be to cut sugar. Get it out of there. Cut sugar and just learn how to breathe properly. Um, I want to show you a quick demonstration on how to breathe. Super easy, okay? <clears throat> So, what I want you guys to do is just kind of sit up straight, okay? I know we're getting a little crazy here, you know? Okay, so you're going to sit up straight, and you're going to suck in the belly as much as you can, okay? So, as you inhale, you're going to try to pull the air in through the throat, okay? So, a lot of people, they'll breathe like this, and then they can't continue to breathe. We don't want to do that. We want to breathe in through the nose. You can relax. But we want to breathe in. We want to pull all that air up through the throat. Okay, so it sounds like this. Instead of, okay? So that's kind of tricky to be able to pull in the air. So we're trying to get from the lower part of the lungs and move all the way up. Okay, so let's exhale all the dead air in the body right now. We're gonna close the mouth. Okay, and inhale through the nose. Try to pull in from the throat. Hold at the top of the lungs, and we're going to say ha as we exhale. <sighs> Feels weird, right? It's a little bit weird. I know when a lot of uh, people come to my yoga classes, they're looking around like, we don't breathe that way. Like, that, that's crazy. But after a while, when you start incorporating these breathing techniques um, into just the yoga practice, you learn, well, I can't even tie my shoes without effectively exhaling to come down. Right? All these crazy things that we're not, we're not taught. So I promise you, if you practice learning how just to breathe properly, you'll feel amazing. You'll feel a lot better. And you'll be, hopefully, a little bit more energized to maybe start moving slowly into a more physical practice of yoga or qigong or something a little bit more, um, you know, going to the gym or going for walks or whatever it might be. But um, cutting the sugar and learning how to breathe properly and just... Um, taking care of yourself properly, being okay, and being sensitive to your body. So I hope you enjoyed today's talk. I know it was very overwhelming, lots of information there. If you have any questions, ask me please. And I will be doing these talks again at the library, I believe in the evening, uh, next month for Nutrition Month, that's March, and Saturday mornings at my yoga studio. Okay, thank you. Do you have questions?